grace and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, fellow Christians, returning or joining us for the first time, my name once again is Abby Kennedy Adam from the Blackheath and Crystal Palace Circuit in London. Welcome to you all once again to this third session in our introduction to James. In this session, we'll be looking at speech and wisdom, and I add my own warning to James's letter that this week's may be a little harder to swallow as James turns up the um, um, James turns up the tempo. But before we go into the passage, we must spend a little um, time recapping on last week, and it will be very quick because as we need all the time, we have to delve into um, deeper in, a little bit into this this week's. So a quick recap. We learned last week that James is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he didn't follow him in his ministry while he was alive. He became a follower, a disciple, after um, his death and the head of the Jerusalem church. James, this is particularly um, important because my lecturer will be proud of me when I say that he always began any lectures with a text without context is a pretext. A text without context is a pretext. So we must know about the background of the people that James is writing to in order to understand why he's doing so. And so he was writing to Jewish Christians whom he felt needed some stimulation in order to pro produce good actions um, from their genuine faith. And this will be important when we get um, later, we get down later. But now let us begin with a prayer. And I read um, verse 14 of Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. And so now we'll go straight into li to listen to the passage. James 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Thank you. 
Thank you, Max. And so we're now about 20 minutes into our return journey from weekend exit from Birmingham to Surrey, some 120 miles. Just before joining Birmingham to Torres Spaghetti Junction, and those familiar with this junction will know what I'm talking about. It's no mean feat. Anyway, just before we join the motorway, my son, who by now a teenager and wanting to stamp his cultural roots on his majority white school and friends, calmly says to me, Mom, I've forgotten my Afro comb. I calmly not, accompanied by a few colourful words, managed to leave at the safest and nearest junction to return home for the said Afro comb so pertinent to this identity. So we got home and the said Afrocomb was retrieved. I like to say that at this point, as an Ashanti woman, I'm still hollering and, and, and shouting and, and making noise. It hadn't stopped. And so back in the car and we're about to set off for the return journey, set back about another 40 minutes. And in the midst of burning, I paused and asked him um, to join me in prayer which was accompanied by a tone of, dear Lord, we commend our journey once again into your hands. I ended the prayer, opened my eyes to a starry glare from my son, followed by the question, why do you do that? Why do I do what? How do you manage to change voices? Your tone changed when you were praying, as opposed to when you were shouting at me. And so the conversation carried on. And I like to made the disclaimer that at, that at this point I was a, a trainee or a student presbyter, as we call it in the Methodist Church, being tested for my uh, vocation and training. And so comes James' warnings and, uh, and words to teachers. Let not any of you become teachers. James has a sober admonition that those who become teach, for those who become ch teachers in the church, they must take their responsibility serious because their accountability is greater and they shall receive a stricter judgment. It is easy to take the position of teacher lightly in the church without considering its cost in terms of accountability. Jesus warned to whom much is given for they much will be required and to whom much have been committed of they will ask more. The words of Jesus reminds us that being among teachers in God's church is more than a simple matter of having natural or even simple gifts. For the James, this department of church work had become extremely popular, extremely popular for its supposed status in society. And therefore he is keen to, to stamp out or emphasize its seriousness this, to stamp out or emphasize the seriousness of his responsibility. So James is in effect saying, right come with responsibilities. It has privileges, but also comes with, with responsibilities. So, so far we've been through in our introduction of um, James, we've been through um, being doers of the word by Reverend Ruhama. We've seen faith and works. We've gone through faith and works by me, um, which complement each other. And now James is turning to those who believe that they have the natural inclination to be preachers. So why is James warning um, the so-called preachers? You know, some some um, commenters call um, call the title the peril uh, or the teacher's peril. As I mentioned earlier, context is very important. So let's remind ourselves again why James is writing about this. Chapter three, verse one, my brothers, it is a mistake for many of you to become teachers for you must understand those of us who teach will receive a greater condemnation. And so in the early church, teachers were of first grade importance. Wherever they are mentioned, they are mentioned with honor. In the church at Antioch, they are ranked with the prophets who sent out who sent out Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary act, uh, missionary journey in Acts one. In Paul's list of those who hold great gifts within the church, teachers come second only to the apostles and to the prophets. Again, um, first letter of Corinthians chapter twelve twenty eight, and this is compared with Ephesians four eleven. 
the apostles and the prophets were forever on the move, a bit like um, presbyteral ministry in Methodism. Their field was their whole church. So Mr. Mr. Wesley is known to have said, the world is my parish. They were on the move. He was on the move all the time on, on his horseback. Their field was the church and they did not stay long in any one congregation. But the teachers worked within the congregation and their supreme importance was that it must have been to them that the converts were handed over for instruction in the facts of the Christian gospel and for the edification of the Christian faith. So their task was to preach the, 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 the gospel, to proclaim the gospel as we and to prepare people for the Christian life. It was the teacher's awe-inspiring responsibility that he or she could put the stamp of his own faith and knowledge on those who were entering the church for the first time. In the New Testament itself, we get glimpses of teachers who failed in their responsibility and became false teachers. There were teachers who tried to turn Christianity into another kind of Judaism and tried to introduce circumcision and keep the law of the acts. There were teachers who lived out nothing of the truth which they taught, whose life was a contradiction of their instruction, and who did nothing but bring this honour of the faith they represented, as we heard, as we learn in Romans 2, 17 to 29. There were some who tried to teach before they themselves even knew anything, according to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And others, there were others who pandered to the false desires of the crowd. And so as we learn about false teachers, with just hours to go before our third series in our Lent Bible studies, before the lockdown was announced, we were going to discuss heretic, heretics and the teachings of one such heretic known as Marcion um, or Marcionism. The Marcionism was founded um, on, on, on the um, beliefs of their founder, Marcion of um, Sinope in Rome, who held the view that the God of the Hebrew Bible was inconsistent. He was jealous, he was wrathful and genocidal. Marcion believed that Jesus was the saviour sent by God and Paul the apostle was his chief apostle. So far, so good. So Marcion and his followers believed that the wrathful Hebrew God was separate than the all forgiven God of the New Testament. And so they couldn't, he couldn't reconcile himself to this. And thus he urged his followers to read only the New Testament and not the Old Testament. But it wasn't too long before he actually realized, or they realized, that they couldn't get very far in the New Testament without reading the Old Testament. And so he um, became a heretic. So a bit, an example of, you know, some, some would be false, false teachers. Hold your tongue, Abna Kwedu, hold your tongue. Warnings from my great grandmother on many occasions and speak no evil as I harangued others, my brothers. This may be familiar words, but apart from false teachers, James also believes that teaching is a dangerous occupation for any man or woman, for their instrument is speech and their agent the tongue, a little red muscle called a tongue in the mouth, yet very dangerous. Thus James is keen to point out that the, res uh, the responsibility of the danger, dangerous character of the tongue. It would be like getting through the eye of a needle, was the response from my Sunday school teacher of blessed memory when I shared the news about my acceptance to train for ordained ministry. You'll be tested like you've never been before. Nothing will ever prepare you for what lies before you. And so it was that the Christian teacher entered a dangerous tradition. In the church, the teacher took the place of the rabbi in Jerusalem. of the rabbi in Jerusalem. The rabbi was treated in a way that was responsible to ruin the character of any man. The rabbi, his very name means my great one, 
and everywhere he went, he, was, he or she he was treated with the utmost respect. It was held that a man's duty to his rabbi exceeded his duty to his parents, because his parents only brought him into, into the life of this world, but his teacher brought him into the life of the world to come. Wow. It was said that if a man's parent and a man's teacher were captured by an enemy, the rabbi must be ransomed first. It was true that a rabbi was not allowed to take money for teaching and that he was supposed to support his bodily needs by working at a trade. But it, it was also held that it was especially pious work to take a rabbi into the household and support him with every care. It was desperately easy for a rabbi to become the kind of person whom Jesus depicted, a spiritual tyrant, an ostentatious ornament of piety, a lover of the highest place of any function, a person who glorified in the almost subservient respect showed to him in public. Every teacher runs the risk of becoming Sir Oracle and no profession, no profession is more liable to beget spiritual and intellectual pride. And so it was that every teacher ran the risk of becoming Sir Oracle, as no profession was more liable to beget spiritual or intellectual pride. But there are two dangers that James warns of every teacher, and he warns that they must avoid. In virtue of this high calling, this office, they will either be teaching those who are young in years or those who are children in faith. They must therefore all their lives struggle to achieve two things, to take every care that his or her teaching is the truth and not their own opinions or even their own prejudices. It is fatally easy for a teacher to distort the truth and to teach not God's version, but their own. When I was um, um, a lay worker in a previous life, one Sunday, one Sunday school teacher of many, many decades refused to attend any Sunday school training of any sort, partly um, because she was a school teacher by profession and she didn't feel that the church could give her any more training that could um, you know, enhance her teaching skills, although she'd been a teacher for about 20 years. And so she didn't think the church's meager training could add anything to it. And so it was that one day she would knock, it was, she would knock at my door to complain about the inappropriate language that she had stumbled across while teaching the children in the Bible. When I asked which version she was reading, she referred to an adult version of it, and to which I seriously reminded her about the children and young people's Bible that the church had paid for and supplied um, specially prepared by experts who can work around such unsuitabilities in the Bible. One to me. But it is very important um, that we make ourselves available to the appropriate training in order to be able to be good te the good teachers that James is advocating. And so James warned that those who teach must have every care that they do not contradict this teaching by their life continually or as it were, not, you know, to say, do as I do, but not as I say. Our lives must be examples of the word we proclaim. It is James's warning that teachers, um, teachers have of their own accord entered into this special office, which slightly disagree, as I still bear the bruises of persuasion to go into ministry. But anyway, for James, even after all this persuasion and bruises, one accepted by one's own terms to go into this ministry. And therefore, this choice subjects them to greater testing, as my Sunday school teacher would warn me. Not only are they subject to testing, they're also subject to condemna condemnation if they fail. So James was emphatic because the people to whom James was writing sought after the prestige that we've heard about that accompanied teachers in those days. 
and James is demanding that they should never forget that these rights also came with responsibilities. So now a little more delving into the power of the tongue, the power and the danger of the, this little but powerful agent. James warns, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I beg your pardon, uh, sorry, using um, words from Matthew, um, Matthew 12, 36. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen by the tongue. If we put bits into horses' mouths to make them obedient to us, we can control the direction of their whole body. Look at ships too. See how large they are and how they are driven by rough winds and see how their course is altered by a very small rudder wherever the pressure of the steer uh, man or woman, as I saw recently, desires so. So too, the tongue is a little member of the body, but it makes arrogant claims for itself. This year, my mother and I were to celebrate significant O birthdays with a treat of a cruise for the first time. Sadly, due to COVID-19, it was not to be so. But my excitement and at the, same time, at the same time fear was not only the wonderful Caribbean islands that we would be um, visiting, but the sheer size of this floating hotel housing thousands of people yet kept afloat by seemingly simple instrument, the rudder. Yes, it is a small rudder that turns a large ship. Even so, if we have control of our tongues, it is an indication also that we have control over ourselves. Whoever can control the tongue can bridle the whole body, James, two, James 3, 2. And long before this, Ari Tottle had used the same picture when he was talking about the science of mechanics, saying a rudder is, a small, is small and it is attached to the very end of a ship. But it has much, such power that by this little rudder, and by the power of one man or woman, and that a power gently exerted, the great bulk of ships can be moved. The tongue also is small, yet it can direct the whole course of a man or woman's life. Thus for James, if we can control the tongue, we can control the whole body. But if the tongue is uncontrolled, the whole life is set on the wrong way. A few years or a couple of years ago, we saw a ship that had steered onto the, 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 the shores of, I, I think, Venice. But a cautionary note here that James is not for a moment saying that silence is better than speech, which I sometimes do, but instead he's pleading for the control of the tongue because the damage it causes can be likened to a forest hill. Now, in some occasions when my grandmother said, you know, said to me, you know, watch your tongue, she was actually saying that, you know, you know, think before you speak, you know, speak no evil, see no evil, all that. And so it is that James was pleading, you know, for the same that, that silence is not the answer, but rather control of the tongue, which when set ablaze can be likened to a forest fire, another example he gives. And many of us witnessed the devastating fires in Australia last year and the irreparable damage and fire and its irreparable and fire reaching damage. <clears throat> the picture of the forest fire is one that is common in the Bible. Isaiah 9, 18 says, wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickest of the forest. And this picture was one uh, used by one was one familiar um, <clears throat> familiar with the Jews of Palestine. In their dry season, their, their scanty grass and low growing thorns when set on fire, spread unstoppable flames. So as wide ranging as the forest fire, so too the tongue can damage at a distance. For Jewish rabbis, life and death were in the hand of the tongue. Albeit it has no hands, but as the hand kills, so the tongues. The only difference between the two is that the hand kills at close quarters, but the tongue, they say, 
is called an arrow because it kills at a distance. And so the peril of the tongue goes on. A person can drop a malicious word or repeat a scandalous or untrue story, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> about someone whom he or she does not even know or about someone hundreds of miles away. And this can cause infinite harm. It is uncontrollable. There is nothing so impossible to kill as a rumor, says the co this commentator. And it is my belief that some of these uncontrollable rumors that we're now getting about COVID-19 rumors has led to the WHO, the World Health Organization, deeming such information as infodemic, referring to its, set, its excessiveness, making it such that the solution itself, the solution to this problem, to COVID, can itself be difficult. There is nothing so simple to kill as a rumor. And the uncontrollable rumors about COVID-19 has led to it being deemed as infodemic because of its excessiveness. It's making the solution to COVID-19 itself problematic, getting the right message across. Um, across problematic. And so the tongue is a fire, is a world of iniquity. The fire of the tongue has been used to burn many. The children's rhyme, uh, in it we're told, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Then the one commentator says, this child's rhyme, this children's rhyme is wrong. The bitter pain of a word spoken against us can hurt us for a lifetime, long after broken bones have been healed. Instead, perhaps we must consider sticks and bones may break my bones, but words will cut deeply. Words can be as damaging to the mind as physical blows to the body. As former Miss Virginia, um, Miss Virginia Nancy read, would confess in a book. Nancy described how thoughtless teasing from a close member wounded her deeply in front of others. This relative made jokes about her weight, leaving her mortified. The relative would then brush aside Nancy's complaint and said, only kidding. But it was hurtful. Poking fun at her made her feel very insecure about herself. Words hurt, writes Patricia Evans, author of Teen Torment, overcoming verbal abuse at home and at school, who writes about teen torments and teen bullying, saying words can be as damaging to the mind as physical blows can be to the body. The scars of verbal assault can last for years. And so in a nutshell, what others say to us and what we say to others can last a long time, for good or evil. The casual, sarcastic or critical remark can inflict a lasting injury on another person. And a well-timed encouragement or compliment can inspire someone for the rest of their life. We are no we are no good at this at church, are we? We can all certainly improve. And so taming the tongue. What, what is James saying about taming the tongue? James uses his knowledge of wisdom literature, proverbs, to write, a person who doesn't consider the destructive power of his or her words is like a madman or woman who deceives his or her neighbor and says, I was only joking. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat his fruits, Proverbs 18, 21. There aren't many sins that don't involve talking in some way. It is though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in that little piece of red muscle, the red flesh in our body. And so now we look at the tongue and how it can be a blessing or a curse. With it we bless the Lord and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, there emerge blessings and curses. These things should not be so, my brothers and sisters. And it is said of all the Jewish writers, Jesus ben Sirach, not Jesus ben Nazareth. So Jesus of, uh, Jesus of, um, of ben Sirach, not Jesus of ben Nazareth, was a scribe who had been living in Jerusalem. 
and he was the writer of the Ecle Ecclesiasticus. I have my teeth in. He was most impressed with the terrifying potentialities of the tongue, writing, the tongue, he says, brings honour and shame in its talk, and the tongue of man of woman is his or her fault. We know only too well from experience that there is cleavage in human nature. In, in humans, there is something of a hero and something of a villain, something of a saint and something of a sinner. And it is James's conviction that nowhere is this contradiction more evident than in the tongue. A bad biting tongue had cast out many a virtuous women and deprived them of their labours. The stroke of the whip marks the skin of the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaks the bones. Oh, I could go on forever, but I won't. John Bunyan described the talkative. He was a saint abroad and a devil at home. Many a man speak with perfect courtesy to strangers and even preaches love and gentleness and yet snaps with impatient irritabilities at his own family. Yes, me in the car. It has not been unknown for a woman to speak with sweet graciousness at a religious meeting and then to go outside to murder someone's reputation, someone's reputation with a malicious tongue. Yes, all is forgiven, son. I remember watching a Ghanaian drama called Asoriba, which means I'm um, uh, um, a church member, with two of my nieces who were both five at the time. This, uh, the, the main character of this um, program was the leader of the Women's Fellowship, a pious and dedicated teacher of the Bible, one virtuous woman, one who could be described as a virtuous woman in Proverbs, but, uh, Proverbs 31, a counsellor on all matters relating um, to good marriage, but a tyrant at home. Her poor, suffering, alcoholic husband was often the victim of her verbal abuse. In one tirade of abuse, when her husband had reportedly eaten the oranges earmarked to break this lady's fast, all night fasting. As my nieces watched the, this program, one, of, one said to the other, why would you marry a woman like that? Get my drift? There were only five. And so you have it, the tongue of a Christian woman. And so Jesus, um, James says that with the tongue, we bless God. And this blessing was especially relevant to a Jew, that whenever the name of God was mentioned, a Jew must respond, blessed be he. Three times a day, the devout Jew had to repeat the Shema Ne Esre, the famous 18 prayers called eulogies, now every one of which begins, blessed be thou, O God. God was indeed the blessed one, the one who was continually blessed. And so to James, there was something unnatural about this use of the tongue. And as natural and wrong as such things might be, sadly, they were tragically common as they are sadly in our churches, in our lives today. But these things, James urges us that, that they should not be. And so the difficulty of taming the tongue and its contradictory character. We read in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Mm. And so there are many ways, many sins that don't involve talking in some way. It is though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in that little piece of flesh. The human spirit has incredible capacity for sacrifice and self-control. Last week, we touched on the capacity of this in the unconscious bias that we discussed. No man can tame the tongue. Nevertheless, the tongue can be brought under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit. We might say that only God himself is mightier than the tongue itself. When we bless our God the Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the solitude of God. The tongue can be used for the highest calling to bless our God, yet it can be used for the lowest of evil to curse 
human beings. Peter's tongue confessed Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, and denied him with curses. And so did John, who wrote, little children love one another. And yet he wanted to say the word to bring down fire from heaven on a Samaritan village. These things ought not to be so. Our speech should be consist consistently glorifying to God. We shouldn't use one vocabulary or tone for speaking at a church and a different one at home or at our jobs. And I put my hand up here, as in my case with the Afro uh, comb story. According to James, we must be able to include ourselves in any of the stumbling or hindrances that that, that does not enable us to yield good fruits. And it is thought that these outbursts of James suggest that he himself had suffered from the strife of the tongue in the religious world, in the church, perhaps in the synagogue, because it reads like a bitter experience, according to one commentator. And so we have a long way to go with our speech, certainly words that are not permitted in any society outside of the church is uttered without any, you know, without any regard or any thought. And when uh, one is pulled up, it is said, oh, it is only a joke, we're only joking. My colleague and good friend set up the pro project, set up the listening project to allow space for people to deal with the past hurts of the church, people who had left the church to come back and to have um, to come into a safe sanctuary where they can, um, you know, their, 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 their hurts can be listened to. And so again, we go back to the document last week um, that we heard where the church, is, the church is challenged to acknowledge the ways in which it has failed to live up to its calling and to continue to prayerfully reflect on the boundaries it establishes. Most importantly, it is reminded um, of its own need for forgiveness and the grace and to turn to God to seek new life in Christ. Spurgeon writes that unless you are generated, born from above by a new and heavenly birth, you are not Christians, whatever you may be called, and you cannot produce the fruit which is acceptable to God any more than a fig tree can produce olive berries. He goes on to say, you can label a fig tree, you can label a fig tree, olive tree, but that will not make it an olive tree. Or you can transplant the fig tree into the Mount of Olives and that will not make it an olive tree. And so James is encouraging his audience and us to seek the true wisdom from God and to submit to this wisdom. And he writes, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then a peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, as we heard. James is advocating this wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God, God's wisdom that has good fruits. It is pure, it is peaceful, it is gentle full of mercy, without hypocrisy, without pretending to be what it is not, always acting in its own character, never working under a mask. It always seeks nothing but God's glory and using no other means to attain it other than its own prescribing. It is a wisdom full, it is a wisdom without partiality. To James, earthly wisdom, instead of bringing people together, drives them apart. Instead of producing peace, it produces strife. There is a kind of person, he says, who is undoubtedly clever with a cute brain and skillful tongue, but its effect, nevertheless, in any committee, in any church or in any group, is to cause trouble and to disturb personal relationships. And so it is a sobering thought to remember that this wisdom is devilish rather than divine, not the fruit of righteousness that is sown or reaped in peace. And so it, once again, it could be argued that James was saying something which every Christian church and every Christian group should have written or implanted on their heart. With one voice, 
the Jewish, all the Jewish sages agreed that this wisdom came to us from God. And it is a wisdom described as the breath of the power of God and a pure influence flowing from the glory of the almighty God, according to the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 25. And so saving the best to last, who ought never to be a preacher. And so with all this said, among who of you not to be a preacher? At the beginning of James 3, he he's addressing uh, those who want to be teachers or those who are already teachers. There he tells them uh, how teachers should talk. Here he's speaking about how they should live. They must be wise. The Greek sophos is used here. The, pref the preferred choice of the Jewish rabbis, sophos, wise, you know, used for a teacher to describe a scribe, a sage, the rabbi. James is advocating faith and works, which equates in this um, sense, wisdom and understanding. And he describes this as that which is the invisible inner qualities. If a person considers him or herself to be wise or understanding, it is fair to expect that this invisible inner quality would show itself in regular life. It will manifest itself in regular life. Here James is telling us how to judge if a person really is wise and understanding. And so it is said that a woman once came to John Wesley and said she knew what her talent was. And she told him, I think that my talent from God is to speak my mind. Mr. Wesley replied, is said to have replied to this lady, I don't think God will mind if you buried that talent. Speaking forth everything that comes to mind is unwise and can be poisonous speech. And so who ought not to be preacher? Again, I consider the argument or the definition for the priesthood of all believers, which is the doctrine of the Protestant Christian church that every individual has direct access to God without ecclesiastical mediation. And each individual shares the responsibility of ministering to the other members of the community of believers. The doctrine asserts that all humans have access to God through Christ, the true, through Christ, the true high priest, and thus do not need a priestly mediator. This then introduced a democratic element in the functioning of the church that meant all Christians were equal and the ordained clergy thus were representatives of the entire congregation preaching and administering um, the sacraments and in terms and in Methodism pastoral oversight as well. In exploring understandings of ministry the Methodist Church writes Christ has many services to be done some are easy others are difficult some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests others are contrary to both Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. These words are part of the service in which once a year we Methodists renew our covenant relationship with God, are a reminder of the immense range of ways in which Christians are called to respond to God's love and grace, both inside and outside of our church walls. And these patterns of response to God's generous love might be described as ministry in Methodism. Marjorie Dobson, hymn writer of hymn number 664, Lord, you call us to your service, also offers her summary, offers us her summary of her passionate advocacy of the priesthood of all believers. She writes, everyone has a place in God's mission and work. Wherever you are, what, whether you're an academic or someone who doesn't feel that you have much to offer, whether you are ordained or not, whether you have recognisable talents and skills, or are always somewhat in the background, female or male, young or old, it doesn't matter, for God welcomes you, for God welcomes you, and our singing ought to reflect this. So with all this said then, once again the question, who among you ought not to be a teacher? James returns to the beginning of the chapter, chapter three, his argument runs like, is run, run like this. 
Is there any of you who wishes to be a real sage and a real teacher? Then let them live a life of such beautiful graciousness that will prove to all that gentleness is, a, is enthroned as the controlling power within the heart. James acknowledges that it is difficult to be a teacher or a preacher and to remain humble, but it is an absolute necessity of the role. Humble in speech, humble in faith and action. I believe this is very important in the advocacy of the priesthood of all believers. He wants that the real scholar will be far more aware of what he or she does not know than of what he or she knows, as indeed the case of our school Sunday school teacher, and in this case, as um, as earlier mentioned, Mr. Wesley's friend. So then, what is James saying? He said that we must try to reap the harvest which a good life brings, but the seeds which bring the rich harvest can never flourish in any atmosphere other than one of right relationship between us. And the only people who can sow these seeds and reap these rewards are those whose life work has been to produce such right relationships, the teachers, the sages, the rabbi. We return to Marjorie's hymn, which is pertinent. The first verse calling us to question where all our gifts and skills lie in order to serve God's church. Lord, you call us to your service, each in our own way, some to caring, loving, healing, some to preach or pray, some to work with quiet learning, truth discerning day by day. And yet the power of all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us, according to the Methodist Worship Book, page 28. And so we pause for a thought here. Being careful about how we speak is clearly the key theme for James and particularly relevant in today's world that has so many ways of communicating. And so my question, how might the importance of speaking well and avoiding evil speech shape our lives as disciples of Jesus? And how might James's teaching affect our use of social media email, internet, WhatsApp, and all the others that we're familiar with. And so thank you for joining me um, for this session. I'm sorry that it's a bit longer than the first, but you, you, I hope you agree that we needed to go in depth. So I hope it has been as educational for you as it has for me. Hope to hopefully see you next week with Reverend Rohama. In the meantime, stay well, stay safe, and stay ble blessed. We end with a closing prayer. Send, your, send us your directing spirit and pour your power through that we may be free in living and in giving all for you. Amen.